Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came upon, uh, up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still, not, is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Revelation 9, 13 to 21. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue and yellow as sulphur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions and out of their mouths came fire, smoke and sulphur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke and sulphur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes, having heads with which they inflict injury. The rest of, the man of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands, they did not stop worshipping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality or their thefts. Well, if you've been following the, uh, the news this uh, past week, you would have heard the ominous warning. Israel has been saying all week, to Hamas, that it will invade Gaza, that it will find each and every single one of them, and that they will annihilate Hamas entirely. That's quite a warning, isn't it? And in spite of the enormous, I mean, I think it's something like now 750 bombs have been dropped across Gaza, uh, and thousands of these Hamas um, terrorists have already been killed. And last I heard, a dozen of the top military commanders of Hamas have been assassinated. In spite of all of that, Hamas continues to fire rockets into Israel, continues to, by water as well, try to, to strike Israel with, with raids, terrorist raids. It, you don't hear it much on the news, but that's ongoing. It's not just Israel bombing, but Hamas is continuing to fire back at Israel. <coughs> In spite of all that, Hamas does not back down. As Israel said um, recently on, on the news, you know, with this call to peace from the United Nations, all it takes is Hamas to surrender and give up their weapons and tomorrow there's peace. But that's the ominous warning to Hamas, but it has made no difference. 
Why do I start with that? Because that's the picture we have in Revelation 9 with regard to the six trumpets. When we take a look at Revelation 8.13, we read this. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. There's the ominous warning. Woe, woe, woe to the world. And when God, through his angel, says woe, he means woe, there's going to be trouble. We've dealt with one woe which affected the environment of humanity, the first four trumpets. But these next trumpets, the one that we're looking at now, affects humanity itself. Remember the fifth trumpet? They had the demons that were unleashed, not by Satan, but by Christ's control. They were unleashed. They were able to affect probably a spiritual attack upon humanity. A, a third wanted to die, but they could not. It eluded them. Death eluded them. But when it comes to the sixth trumpet, that changes. Now it's time for the second menacing woe. But as we turn to that, I want to first of all deal with a big question. A big question that you might be asked by a non-Christian. You may even be thinking about it yourself. Because we're going to hear of a third of humanity being wiped out by God's wrath. And that raises the question, how do we make that work with regard to the picture of God as a God of love? a God who cares for his creation and yet wipes out a third of humanity. H how does that work? It's a question you're bound to be asked if you uh, speak to, to uh, neighbours and others who don't know Christ and who find this probably a question that will say, well, see, there is no God. What you're believing in is a fantasy. This is a contradiction. How can he do this if he's a God of love? Two main answers to that, and there are answers. When we get confused, or when the world says this doesn't add up, they forget, first of all, the holiness of God. In Psalm 5 verse 4 we read, You are not a God who takes pleasure in evil. With you the wicked cannot dwell. God is a holy God. He tempts no one, as it says uh, later on in the New Testament. He tempts no one, and he can be not tempted. He, he is perfect. This is why Jesus had to come and die for our sins, because this holy God could not have sinners come into heaven. He needed godly children. He needed righteous children. And the only way that was going to happen is if Jesus died for our sins and then removed our sins from us. Remember the psalm. He has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. Only with, with our sins removed can we approach a holy God, and can we go to live with him? You know, we, we sang that uh, song a moment ago with regard to immortal, invisible God only wise. We, we sang that, or I chose that, because it speaks of this holiness of God. When we look at that, it says, Great Father of glory, pure Father of light. Note that, pure Father of light. Thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight. So here are the angels, perfect angels, not the ones that were cast down from heaven to the earth, but perfect angels. And even they, it's reminiscent of what we see in Isaiah, Isaiah's his, his vision of God. And what were the angels doing? They had six wings with two. They were covering their eyes. They were veiling their sight. Why? Because of the glory of God. Because of the holiness of God. And then it goes on in that song, O Lord, that is all glory, all praise, we would render, O help us to see, it's only the splendor of light hideth thee. So when we take a look at what this um, next passage in Revelation speaks about, and we may begin to be troubled by a God who unleashes um, this plague and, and this war upon the earth that kills a third of humanity. 
and we ask why, the first answer is the holiness of God. The second is the wickedness of humanity. Big contrast. You see, these that are being wiped out are not innocent. They are not undeserving of what's happening. Uh, I don't know uh, where you stand with regard to Hamas, but most people that I hear and what I see on the news, even those who are appalled by the, the death of Palestinian civilians, innocent ones, by what's going on, they're being caught too. Even those who, who genuinely grieve for the uh, civilian loss of Palestinians will still say Hamas deserves to be wiped out. Well, it's a similar thing as what you find here. When God says he's going to wipe out a third of humanity, it's not that they are undeserving. They are deserving of this with regard to a holy God. How can we say that? What, what do we find in Scripture that bears this out? Well, in 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5, we get a, a description there of what humanity is going to look like in the last days. And guess what? The last days in Scripture are the days from Jesus' ascension into heaven to Jesus' return. You and I are living in the last days. What does it say about our time? So this is not talking about another time. This is talking about our time. What does it say? It says there, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. What do you reckon? Does that give us an apt description of society as we see it around us today? Especially disobedience towards parents? And lack of self-control. You know, look at the rise of road rage. Take a look at the rise of domestic violence. You know, there's this whole generation that had been brought up without discipline, as the Lord has commanded discipline to be given. A whole new way has been trialed. And what are we witnessing? This, th this new generation just doesn't seem to have respect any more for those in authority, the police, let alone their own parents. And that's not the only place we get a description of our times. In Romans 1, 29 to 31, it says, they are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. There it is again. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Describe our world. You know what really struck me? They invent new ways of doing evil. You know what sprang to my, my mind? Gendered transformation of young people with irreversible surgery. Man, if that's not an invention of a new way of doing evil. I've uh, said before to a number of people, I wonder how long it will take when that generation grows up, if that's been done to them, what lawsuits are going to be held against medical facilities and parents with regard to abuse. When these kids grow up and realise just what has been done to them. So we note the same in our text. When you look at Revelation 9, 20 to 21, it says, The rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshipping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone and wood idols that cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality or their thefts. It's a similar description, isn't it? 
And so we're, we're looking at this and we're saying, how do we put these two things together, the love of God and then the wrath of God, which wipes out a third of humanity in our text? The holiness of God and the state of our world. Then it begins to make sense. But I want to add one, one more thing. It shouldn't surprise us because it's happened before. Of course, I'm referring to the flood. In Genesis 6, 5 to 7, we read this. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said what? I will wipe mankind um, whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. The story of Noah's Ark. The world just descended into wickedness until a holy God said no more. But he had made a promise. He had made a promise to Adam and Eve. There would be a seed of the woman who would come that would crush the serpent's head. He hadn't come yet. So God found one man that he maintained in righteousness. Noah wasn't particularly uh, an ideal character. God preserved him for the purpose of fulfilling his promise. And so Noah and his family were spared. And so through Noah, it continues on to Christ. But the rest of the world perished. It's happened before. What do we read in uh, Scripture? When you go back to Genesis, what had the wor world become filled with? It says, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. Mm, was filled with violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. And what do we see in our world today? A rise of violence. What's a trigger for the Lord in terms of total judgment of the earth? Violence. And so with this perspective, we have a better understanding of how these two things can fit together. The love of God, but also the wrath of God. And the outpouring of that with regard to the destruction of ungodly men. But as the people of God, <laughs> how are we to approach this? We say, all right. We can understand God is holy and we can understand the wickedness of the earth that requires his judgment. But we're going to go through this. Remember in the, the book of Revelations, in, in Romans, uh, Revelation 6, we get the saints under the altar who say, how long, O Lord? And God says, not until the full number of the martyrs has come in. And he, he says in a number of the letters to the churches, things are going to get worse and more of you will die for the faith. So as we live through this, and as God's people in the future, if we die and it's still going on, how are they to live through this? Well, again, in the details here, we get great comfort. Note where the voice that commands the, the trumpet to be blasted comes from. It comes from the altar of God. But not just the altar, but it comes from the horn of the altar. Why is that reason for comfort? Because it was on that altar, going back to uh, the, the whole sacrificial system, where the blood for the atonement of sins was poured. The voice comes from the horn of the altar that's before God. And that's a connection to Christ. I, all along we have been singing uh, seeing that Christ is in control. It is from Christ's command that these things unfold, that these things happen. We saw that with regard to the breaking of the seals. No one was found worthy to break the seals, except for the Lion of Judah. He was worthy 
And what happens? He begins to break the seals. And then everything else you find in the book of Revelation proceeds from that breaking of the first seal. And it began with Jesus. And it continues with Jesus. So what we find in the sixth trumpet and what happens is at the behest, it's under the control, it's, it's by the command of Christ. That should give us great heart. But it's also the same altar that's mentioned in Revelation 6, under which we find the souls of the martyrs who cry out, how long, Lord, before you avenge our blood? And so you have this imagery of the horn of the altar, that's where the voice comes from, but it's the same altar under which these saints are who cry out, how long? And the Lord says, not until all the martyrs have come in. Remember last time, or a recent sermon, we saw that with regard to those bowls, they were filled with the prayers of the saints. We were there in heaven. Our prayers are being heard. As we pray, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, what are we also praying for? The blasting of the sixth trumpet. You're looking forward to the return of Jesus? It won't happen until the sixth trumpet is blown. One final thing I want to show you that gives us great heart in the midst of this outpouring of God's wrath. It all goes according to the plan of God. It's not, you know, hurly-burly. It's not just random. It's, it's just not something that's bad luck. God has a purpose with regard to the judgment of the world. He always has. In Revelation 9.14, what did we read? And the four angels who'd been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Notice that. These are the angels that were kept ready for the very hour and day and month and year. They were there. They'd always been there. They were ready to go when the time was set. When the sixth trumpet is blasted, and a third of humanity is wiped out under the judgment of God against the wickedness of humanity. It will be at a specific time that God has set. And then these angels will not escape, they'll be released. This is really important stuff to note. They will be released. God will release them through Christ. In 2 Peter 3, 3-7, this plan of God continues to be borne out. There were those who, in Peter's day, were, were wondering about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they just scoffed at this whole idea that Jesus reigned and one day was coming back. Already back then, 2,000 years ago, they thought it ridiculous. They, they think it ridiculous today. They reckon you and I are wasting our time here worshipping. We could be out in the beach and going for bushwalks and doing all sorts of things. But listen to what it says. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. There you get the same reference, in the last days. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. And then we read this. But they deliberately, no, not by accident, they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters, also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the word of God, the earth was destroyed back in, in that time. But it was done so by God's word. And then what's, what does it go on to say? By the same word. Note that the word that was used to destroy the earth in Noah's day, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Now note that. Already from the days of Noah, God said, I won't ever destroy the world again by flood. But the earth has been reserved for destruction by fire. And the fact that it's reserved gels with what we've already seen. By the time that God has set. Remember what we saw there? Kept ready for the hour, the day, the month, and the year. 
the time that God has appointed, this will happen. It will happen by the same word of God by which in Noah's day the earth was destroyed. That again should give us heart. This is God at work. And we, the people of God, have nothing to fear. And so we have these, these horrible images with regard to these so-called horses. But again, they're not real horses. Horses don't look like this. This is symbolic, probably symbolic of war. When you take a look at, at, at uh, war, what do you find? You find it associated with fire. Just look at the images of the bombs dropping on Gaza at the moment. When you think of war, you think of fire, you think of plague, you, you think of total destruction. And so, more than likely, these horses represent war. And the end result is a, a, the death of a third of humanity. Unlike what we saw with those locusts that came out of the, the pit in, in the fifth trumpet, where death eluded people, not so with the sixth trumpet. Death doesn't elude them, a third are killed. We would expect the world to wake up to itself. But what do we read? The rest of mankind, that's two-thirds of humanity, the remaining two-thirds, who were not killed by these plagues, still did not repent of the work of their hands. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality or their thefts. Such is the wickedness of humanity. Not even with all those warnings, do they repent? Here we see the patience of God. I mean, in Noah's day, he preached for 120 years before the flood and still people didn't heed the warning. The gospel has been going out for over 2,000 years and still the world is not heeding the warning. In uh, Romans 1, 18 and uh, 21 to 23, we read, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress, there it is again, this active, deliberate forgetting, this suppression of the truth by their wickedness. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. We see that exchange going on today. Although they know about God, they refuse to acknowledge Him as God. They refuse to bow the knee to Him. What is evil? This is an a very important question. What is evil? When you and I and anybody else thinks of wickedness and evil, we, we tend to think in terms of murderers and rapists and pedophiles and, and Putin sending his troops into Ukraine. That, that's wickedness. That's evil. But what does Scripture define as evil? When you go to Psalm 18, verse 21, we read, For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not done evil by turning from my God. This is what the world doesn't get. They think, essentially, I live a good life. I, I do the right thing by my neighbour. I don't murder and, you know, all that sort of stuff. But do you worship God? If the answer is no, God says you are characterized by evil. The greatest evil anyone can do is to reject God, to not give him the worship that he is his due, and to set ourselves up as God. And the consequences of that are clearly seen in the garden because that's what happened with Adam and Eve. And what happened? The earth was filled with corruption and we've been paying the, 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 the bill ever since. To not give God his due is the greatest evil. It leads to all the others. If God is not supreme in your life 
and you're not bound by his love in Christ and seek to live a Christ-like life, what are we led into? Love of self. And where there's love of self, I come first and then everybody else, well, they just come second and, well, we see what happens with regard to domestic violence, we see what happens with pedophilia, we think, see what happens with murder, road rage. All these things are a consequence of ignoring God. So what about you and I? That's where the world's at. It says in 2 Peter 3, 11, since everything will be destroyed in this way, Okay, since everything's going to be destroyed like this, what kind of people ought we to be? That's a big question, isn't it? Since God is one day going to judge the world with the increase or the intensification of the judgment, wiping out a third of humanity, then what should you and I be like? We're living in a world that is fast ripening for judgment. In our text yet, it's not ripe for judgment. It's getting there, but not there yet. But we live in this world that's ripening for judgment. What sort of people should we be? Well, in Galatians 1, 3 to 4, we read this. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of God our Father. So the the first thing that we need to be is conscious of the fact that we have been rescued from this evil age. We're living in it, but we've been rescued from it. Jesus put it this way, be in the world, but not of the world. One of the worst things you see churches doing is compromising. The church cannot compromise itself it cannot compromise the word of god it cannot modify the message in order to fit in and escape persecution that's the first thing we have to understand we have to live as those who have been rescued from the present evil age we are not to identify with it we are not to conform to it In John 15, 18 to 19, Jesus put it this way. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. So the second thing um, I want to show you here is that what should we look like since God's going to destroy the world this way? We should expect indeed that we're not going to be liked by the world. In fact, Jesus said, and Jesus is no liar, that we will be hated by the world. If you're looking for acceptance as a Christian in today's society, you're not going to find it. The only way you will find it is if you deny your relationship to Jesus, if you turn away from God, which the psalmist, I remind you, said, to turn away from God is evil. So we have to maintain that relationship. We have to maintain that identity that we have in Christ. We have to be those who have been rescued from the present evil age. There's much more I can say on this, but I just want to finish with this, which happens to be Florence's and my wedding text all those years ago. Remember Joshua led the people into the promised land. And at the end of his life, he puts before them that they have to remain faithful to God. He warns them that they will, in fact, fall away. And they they insist, no, 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 we won't. And then Joshua says, you will. And he says, this is what I'm going to put before you. And this is what he says. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me... And my house, we will serve the Lord. So what sort of people ought you (laughs) you and I to be in this present evil age? And let's understand we live in an evil age at present. And its wickedness is increasing and will continue to increase. What sort of people ought we to be? People who say, we stand here. 
do what you want to do. But as for me and my family, my household, we will serve the Lord. That's where we must stand. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank and praise you that as we live in this present evil age and as its wickedness increases and as, as it ripens for judgment, that we can see indeed that you are a holy but also a just God who cannot tolerate wickedness. That as you uh, destroyed the world in Noah's day, that indeed, Lord, so you will do so again, but this time by fire. As surely as that word was powerful and effective in the destruction of the earth in that time, by that same word, it will be just as effective when Jesus returns. And so, Lord, as we come before you, we pray for our earth. We pray indeed, Lord, that during this time of patience, where the gospel is going forth, that many may yet hear the word also through us here in this, this little town and this little shire. Even though we are small in number, we pray that our voice will be loud. We pray, Lord, that you'll bless what we have to say through various means that we use to bring the gospel to people here in this community. But we pray that through your church worldwide, the word will go forth and the harvest, that inheritance that Jesus is looking for, will indeed be brought in. And Lord, we pray for ourselves that we may have the faithfulness of Joshua, that we, we too, by your spirit, will be kept for Jesus that we will not stand with the world, but we will stand with you. That we will say, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Help us to be faithful to the end. No matter what comes against us, no matter how terrible the pain or punishment, no matter the threats, help us to know that Jesus suffered for us first and foremost. And he calls us, Lord, also to be prepared to suffer for him, that we who lose our life for his sake will in fact find it. And so, Lord, we pray, continue to work your spirit in our hearts, draw us closer to Jesus, and give us the strength to be faithful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.